Well, good morning, Bob. Good to see you again. Yes, good morning, Tammy. Same here. Always good to see you. Yes. Um, now we have 365 days to go before we get that extra hour of sleep we missed last night. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Um, in, in just a quick, um, quickly, I actually should have asked you this before I hit record. Um, I've heard two different reasons why daylight savings time. What is your understanding of the why behind messing with our bodies and our heads and the clocks? <laughs> you know, I always understood it. And it's when my children were younger, it was always an issue about getting them to the to this, the, the bus stop, not being in the dark um, and that they or coming off the bus that they wanted the time schedule. So there was always some light there. And I never really adhered to that too much. It seemed kind of crazy to me. But there is a circadian change that takes place in our body. There's no doubt about that. Light is a wonderful stimulus for us, especially going from transitioning from sleep cycle to wake cycle. Um, we need to, to get out of bed in the morning and see that sunshine in order mm -hmm. to get going again. That, that triggers a whole host of biochemical reactions for us. Uh, and some people adjust to it very quickly. Others do not. Uh, I'm not sure where I personally fit in on that. Um, but I, I've noticed that uh, as the years go by, um, for instance, this year, um, I find that it's a, a little bit more sluggish because of that loss of one hour. Um, yeah. And also, since we're on the topic about medication now, medication is now behind an hour uh, somewhat because you're usually taking your 7 a.m. dose, but it's really 8 a.m. Um, so it, does your body feel that difference? Does it know it? How does the Parkinson's patients deal with that? Um, you know, so that's that's an issue uh, for, yeah. for some people anyway. Yeah, actually, that's a great segue into our conversation today. And um, and it would be interesting. I actually may tomorrow at our Parkinson's um, class ask everybody, like, how did how to go? Like, what do you do? Like, do you change when you take your medicine? Like, give me examples. I would love to hear how how our fr friends with Parkinson's respond. Um, Because yeah, I, I would. Hmm, too. Yeah. And um, so you always make things sound so smart and so um. Like now it doesn't sound stupid that we talked about our circadian rhythm. You know, the rest of us are like, oh, why are they messing with the clocks? Right. Yeah. Um, so one of my understandings was too, it was like based on like the farmers, like farming, like getting up, you know, like I'm, um, I come from a very big farming community, a very big, I'm much a country girl. And it was always tied to farming, you know, um, in, in my understanding and, and how we talked about the clocks changing. Um, and there are some places, you know, obviously that they don't change the clocks. So yeah, it's just, it's just curious, just a curious yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And everybody react, even the animals react differently to, mm -hmm. to time change. I mean, every, everybody feels it in one way or the other, um, yeah. which would be wonderful if we could, we, we talk about this every year, as far as the politics behind it, about just making it uniform all the way across. Uh, you know, I know, uh, like Hawaii, for instance, they just, they're on daylight savings time all year round, you know, mm -hmm. probably a very smart thing. So yeah. they keep talking about it in Florida. I mean, we are the sunshine state anyway. So, you know, yeah. but it just seems to happen. And I, um, I grew up in the upper peninsula of Michigan and no matter what time of year it was, well, not in the summer, but pretty much during the school year, we were always getting on the bus in the dark. And like, there was a whole yes. lot of not finding time. <laughs> I mean, we would have yeah. a four hour school day in the summer in the winter time if we were trying to like hit the light you know so oh, yeah yeah um, absolutely but with that being said um let's finish or not finish let's continue our conversation that we had um from the last conversation uh we were talking mm -hmm. about exercise and medication yes. but a big part of that conversation um is going to lead to like um going into the hospital uh do's and do nots and, and and really good some good tips and advice that you gave to our um our our friends now you did say something um during our conversation about how medicine is distributed how it's do um dosed go ahead and like take away with that yeah well i you know one of the things we spoke about was um was pill load uh that we brought to everyone's attention or sometimes referred to as pill burden um 
that I, I want to, <laughs> yeah, and, and it can be a burden um, mm -hmm. and it's an issue. It comes up an awful lot and you have to realize it's a huge concern, especially in our Parkinson's community. Um, there's a lot of medication out there. You know, mm -hmm. um, statistically, the CDC says that if, if you're 65 years or older, that uh, over 40% of those patients are taking a minimum of five prescription drugs a day. And my guess is that's probably based on just normal comorbidities that a 65 year old would encounter, such as blood pressure issues, diabetes, thyroid, prostate, whatever. Then you add a complicated um, condition like Parkinson's on top of that, that, that five medications could easily double in, in no time at all. And then you talk about perhaps complex dosing regimens where not all of those are just one a day. Some of them are three times a day, five times a day, uh, times five, six, eight different medications. It becomes a huge burden for a lot of patients. <clears throat> um, and I've seen it many times. Uh, and what happens is we've, we've demonstrated time and time again that as that pill burden increases, compliance decreases. You know, the more they have to take, it becomes overwhelming sometimes right. for them. Um, and, and again, the other factor that contributes to that is there's a cost factor. Having these patients buy all this medication, they're, they're not free in most cases. There's co-payments right. or completely out of pocket. Uh, it becomes a real burden for them financially. So, and I've seen it many times where they're, they're they come into the pharmacy, for instance, and it's a toss up. Which one should I get refilled until my check comes in on the first? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so and sometimes they'll just they'll make that decision on their own when they get home. They'll just stop taking something until it's time. You know, um, that's really unfortunate. And that yeah, happens at the gym quite a bit. People um, I've had clients who are like, you know, I'm my doctor says I need to take this this additional prescription and I can't afford to continue to go to the gym or I can't afford my medicine. You know, like yeah. they have to choose one or the other, you know, and yeah, it seems. Yeah. And then, of course, you throw in copay the copayment to go see <clears throat> three, four, five different doctors all the time mm -hmm. for all different comorbidities. Right. Um, now, all of a sudden, their finances have been redirected to just trying to deal through this. Another common thing that I see very often is, is people would come into the pharmacy um, and they'll bring their bottles in and I they'll tell me what's in here. And I look. And there's two or three different pills in the same bottle, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they try to consolidate and mix things together. And sometimes they get it wrong. Yeah. Um, and I'll see maybe they, they inadvertently put their uh, gastric reflux pill. It got mixed in with their thyroid medication, you know. So now I have to ask myself, well, the medication for your reflux was taken twice a day. The thyroid was only once a day. Were you taking your thyroid twice a day thinking that it was your gastric? Re I don't know that. Um, and so this hey. happens all the time. Yeah, that would be an easy mistake to make. Um, you know, I, I feel like when I look, when I see like just a random pill sitting and I, I don't, we don't have really any prescriptions in our house, but like if someone like we have ibuprofen and we have Tylenol and like yeah. there'll be a pill on the counter and I'll look at it and it doesn't like, it's not stamped with the word Tylenol on the pill, no. you know, it's got like no. a letter and no. I'm like, which one is this, you know, and I have to open the whole bottle to see where it goes into. But if, I mean, that's confusing, even when you only have ibuprofen and Tylenol in your house, I can't imagine if you had five to 10 prescriptions yeah. that you're trying you to sink these, uh, pill packs that have like four rows times seven days. Right. Yeah. Um, you're talking 28 different little little compartments that they're trying right. to fill medications in. Uh, and a lot of times they have visual problems. Maybe they're dealing with a, a cataract or they're dealing with a convergence issue because of their mm -hmm. Parkinson's. Um, you know, a, a light pink That's tablet true. looks the same as another one and, and they put it in the wrong, uh, yeah. you know, square. The other issue I see very common is left what we call leftovers. They, they were given a prescription for something that was meant to be for a short term. Um, and maybe it's, it's a reflux issue, for instance. So they used it and took care of it, but they never discarded the bottle when the, when the problem was resolved. And it's still in their basket. 
uh, and they get to the bottle and they go, oh, I don't, I don't even remember what this was for. They don't recognize the name as a generic name on it. And most of the time, the mm -hmm. label doesn't have a diagnosis on it, what you're using the pill for. Sure. So now they start either they, they start now they start incorporating it back into their regimen because they don't remember what it was prescribed for in the first place. Um, and so this adds to their pill burden again uh, because they're reusing leftover stuff. So that's actually an interesting scenario. And if I were in that situation and I was, um, and I knew I like medicine is important to me and in order to function, I need to do it properly. And if I saw something I wasn't familiar with, it's Sunday, it's nine 16 on a Sunday. Like what, who do I call? Like, what do I like? That's kind of a lonely, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's funny because a lot of people, they have the mindset <laughs> Two drug classes that I see this all the time. First, the antibiotics. The second is pain medication. The doctor gives you a 10-day supply of the antibiotic. By day five, you feel fantastic. So there's still five days worth of the antibiotic. So they say, you know, I'm going to save this in case the next time I get sick, I don't have to go to the doctor. I'll go back on that antibiotic again because it worked beautifully this time. Um, so that's one issue why some of these things linger around the house for a long time. Pain meds are another example. You know, they give you 20, 30, 40 tablets of a pain med. You take only five or six. The pain's gone. It worked beautifully. Ah, I'm going to save this for the next time. Or if someone in the family gets hurt, I can give them some of this to help them out uh, and possibly avoid a doctor visit. And this happens all the time. We're all guilty of that to a certain level. We all have stuff stored around, probably in the house or in a medicine cabinet and in the bathroom or whatever, stuff that we probably were one time prescribed an ointment, for instance, people love mm -hmm. keeping the what's left in the tube uh, for months and years. They, you know, mm -hmm. it never expires. They just keep it around. Uh, so you can see how very easily that pill load and pill burden begins to, to grow or the potential for errors uh, escalates yeah. dramatically. So, and there's no easy fix for it, Tammy. I have to say, you know, we, um, especially since we're focusing a lot with Parkinson's, those medications, of course, are absolutely essential, but yeah. we have to realize there are many other conditions that a patient can have in addition to that, um, that adds to the complexity of their dosing regimens. We try all the time to try to encourage doctors and patients to try to get them on an, an extended release version of the drug uh, so we can go from three pills a day to only one. Um, We'll try to incorporate, there are many, let's say, for instance, you're on a cholesterol medication and a blood pressure medication. There are products out there that contain those two ingredients in one pill. So that perhaps a conversation with your, your primary or cardiologist, can we do that? Uh, same thing with blood pressure, people that are on two different blood pressure medications. Very often we have pills that have those two pills, uh, two medications combined in one. So that's one area to pursue. Um, sometimes topical options are available. There are transdermal patches for certain uh, types of medication that can be used, uh, particularly in Parkinson's, you know, and we've spoken about new things coming down about pumps, you know, like an insulin pump uh, that can be used for Parkinson's. Um, there are new intranasal sprays that, will, that are trying to get uh, marketed right now for Parkinson's. So these are different delivery systems that will take us away from the oral form um, and might help, you know, minimize some of the confusion and make their daily lifetime. Because I have to tell you, it's not, oh, it's not the patient sometimes, it's the care partner that that task is left oh, yeah. for. Yeah, um, yeah, I would think and so. That's, that's a job and a half. These people have no pharmacy background or healthcare, uh, you know, background. And now they're left with some very serious medications, very powerful drugs that that partner is on and, and timely administration of that is critical. So they're left with a very serious task to do that. And I, I can see how it can be very frustrating and how quickly compliance can can drop. Right, right. And that's actually, um, you know, in Parkinson's, you know, the timing of when you take your medicine matters so much, right? So on that note, because it is a, you know, it is oftentimes a care partner, you're relying on somebody else to help make sure that you're um, doing it properly, you've got the right dose at the right time and all that, you know, we, we have husbands and wives that we are 
um, we love so much. We want to support because they are doing an sure. amazing job with helping their partners. You brought up, and this happens a lot to our friends. In fact, we had a gentleman in our um, in our class this last week who, um, well, he wasn't in our, our class. We have friends that shared that he was in the hospital with pneumonia. And um, so he had to miss our class. And pneumonia is, you know, um, huge, you know, breaks and, you know, pneumonia for people with Parkinson's. But, um, yeah. you know, so he's in the hospital and probably his wife isn't there 24-7. Um, can we trust that the hospital will be as diligent with our medication as, as yeah. our spouses are? Whew. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and can we trust them? Of, of course, you know, they're, they're, they're a healthcare facility, but the reality is uh, it's difficult. It, and, and as much as we try to uh, convey the importance of their medication on time, every time, um, it, spe specifically their Parkinson's meds we're referring mm -hmm. to right now, um, it's not always feasible in the real world. Now, there are, and, and patients worry about that because they don't sure. want to see their Parkinson's symptoms worsen uh, while they're in the hospital uh, because the, uh, the staff and the doctors are focused on another issue that brought them to the hospital. The Parkinson's probably didn't bring them to the hospital. They're there for some other reason. Uh, and, and the patient just doesn't want the facility to lose sight of their Parkinson's while they're there. Um, and this becomes an issue. Uh, you know, there are many stories out there. I'm sure any, any PD patient who hops online can read all kinds of stories about patients who had hospital admissions that uh, were difficult because of untimely presentation with their Parkinson's med. Now, we are making great strides in this. I can tell you from our end, uh, where we are, um, we have uh, addressed this issue with our local hospitals here, uh, and they have been extremely receptive to that. Um, but, okay. and again, it's, it, it, it's difficult to um, enforce 24-7. Um, there are, the nurses are very busy. They're, the floors, the, the hospitals are usually always at or above capacity. Um, and it's very difficult to maintain if you've got two or three PD patients on your floor that have very complex uh, dosage regimens that go in between the standard dosing scheme for the hospital. It's, it's very tough for the nurses to stay on top of that. And this is why we always advocate to please make sure that that care partner is with the patient or an advocate for the patient to speak for them. Sometimes they may not even be able to speak for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, so you need an advocate there <clears throat> to remind the nursing staff. And they usually, once if, if they are uh, not necessarily running on time, they're usually very happy to accommodate you. Um, but it's not always first in mind for them. They've got 28, 30 other patients that they're trying to do. And then you throw in an emergency on the floor, everything, everyone scatters and whatnot. So it, it really is very difficult. And we've tried to, there are... Um, you know, information brochures. I know the Parkinson's Foundation has something called the Aware and Care Kit, which we're always yeah. advocating uh, that the patients should have. Uh, it's a free kit that you can get from the uh, America, from the Parkinson's Foundation. But what's in that is is really great information. Um, there are little tear off pads that you literally I tell them hand it to anybody. You never. There are so many people coming in and out of your room. You don't know what their role is, but you know what? It, it doesn't hurt to let everyone know from the dietitian all the way to the nursing staff and anything in between that you are a PD patient and you require your medicine on time. Additionally, there are medications that you don't want to be administered. Um, yeah. And that's equally important, probably more important in some cases. Um, and again, that information is provided uh, in handouts. Yeah. And I want you to talk about, um, I mean, when we were in our group, when you talk about that um, situation, that's going to lead to what medicine not to get. But before we get there, um, <clears throat> you said medication on time every time. And we just came off the medic um, talk about sometimes five to six to 10 um, different pills, yeah. maybe various times per day. Can I bring my pills to the hospital? Like, should they have their little pill kit with them when they go to the hospital? Yeah, super question. So, 
And again, this goes back to the aware and care kit, you know, when and if you get it, um, it actually comes in like a little, little pouch uh, where all the information is. And we tell patients use that to scoop up everything you take and bring it with you to the hospital. Uh, So the short answer to your question is absolutely bring your medication to the hospital. The nurses will decide and make sure that the information is being transposed onto your your e, your e file or your e chart um, correctly with the right dose and the right strength. Sometimes it gets uh, mistranscripted. Sometimes they'll mistake extended release for immediate release tablets, uh, and the dosage you end up taking the extended release four times a day and instead of only once a day at bedtime. And the immediate release should be the one taken all day long. That's a very common error, but Aside from that, it's important to make sure that not every hospital, all hospitals are different about bringing medicine from from the outside. And I understand that. Um, They like the drugs dispensed from within their own facility. But in some cases, and and I can speak for the local ones here, uh, they do allow Parkinson's medications anyway that I know of that they do not have on formulary, but they will allow you to bring them in. They don't okay. necessarily allow you to take them yourselves. They want you to relinquish them to the nursing or the pharmacy staff, and it will be dispensed in that manner, but they will allow you to use your medications. Now, that doesn't mean that every hospital is, can do that, but since you don't know what their protocol is, you bring it anyway and let them uh, decide. The other problem with that is if they don't allow that, they may substitute another drug that's similar to what you're on, but they're going to use that because that's the one that's on formulary. Um, and that's not always a good idea. That's something that should be not allowed unless you've discussed it and cleared it with your neurologist. Uh, because even though they're, the, they're the drugs in the same class, sometimes the dosing is different. The side effects may be a little bit different. And of course, we don't really know if your, your motor symptoms are going to respond to it. So um, if you've been doing well on one particular drug in one particular class, changing it to something that's very similar can often lead to a worsening of your, of your uh, motor symptoms. Uh, they're not doing it intentionally. They just think, well, you know, the same, it's like switching Motrin to Aleve, you know, to naproxen. Mm-hmm. Yes, they're in the same category, but some people get maybe more nauseous with the naproxen than they do with the Motrin or whatever. So even though they're in the same class, you may not get the same response from them. And their dose and their dosing is different. Sure. So you have to be mindful of that. <clears throat> and how do you like if they don't allow you to use your own and dispense mm-hmm. your own to you and they want to use their similar one, like what can you do? Like, how do you stop them? Like, can you? Yeah, so, and, and again, if it, it, it's, that's not easy. If, for instance, if it's a, uh, an elective procedure where you know you're coming in at a specific date and time, uh, as opposed to being brought there in an, an ambulance. But if it's an elective procedure, uh, very, very often they suggest that you, uh, the neurologist gives you a note, uh, a letter mm. uh, or some statement saying that, this is a, you know, a, a PD patient. It's essential that they maintain on, this is their Parkinson's regimen. These medications have to be given in these dosages uh, and please allow the patient to use their own supply if any of them are not on formulary. And, and most hospitals, I would imagine, would accommodate uh, a neurologist request in that way. Now, the other, the other side of the coin is if you brought their out of the clear blue, maybe you've fallen and, and you broke something and now you've shown up at the ER, um, you don't have that luxury of speaking to a neurologist. That's problematic sometimes. Um, the only suggestion I could offer you is that you request a, a neurology consult uh, if they were going to change any medication, you know, showing the hospital, look, here's what my, my uh, husband or wife is on. Will you be able to match that? Or are you going to be making substitutes in their Parkinson's meds? And if substitutions are, are inevitable, um, you may want to have an, a neurology consult uh, before they start administering that. Sometimes time is of the essence. You don't have right. that ability. So, And that's where it gets a little tricky sometimes. It's a very gray area. And more importantly, how important it is to have a care partner or an advocate there to help you because your mind is on whatever's bringing you to the hospital. You're really not thinking about all these other things down the road. 
uh, you're mainly focused on that injury. So it's important to have someone with you at all times right. with that. You're right. Good stuff. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, things that I guess I don't, you know, I don't think about, I'm sure um, in probably most people with Parkinson's, when, you know, until that moment occurs, you don't know what you don't know, you know, so, yeah. um, so it's nice to know that we can even just even suggest like that neurology consult, we can come in there with the questions to even ask what our medication, you might assume they just have it there. So it's great. That's great. Um, advising your puppies. <laughs> Sorry, so he cute. opened the door again, uh, you know, and if I try to lock it, he'll scratch at it. And it's got oh. one of those handles that's a lever. So he just puts his paw on it and then in he comes. So it's a smart guy. He's a smart guy. I he's doing a good job there. He just doesn't want to. <laughs> um, so let's say, you know, you that moment of, of <clears throat> pause with our group the other day when you did mention, and I actually, if we have time, I'd like you to kind of even mention anesthesia because that's um, something um, to mm -hmm. be aware of, of that effect on, on a Parkinson's um, patient. But um, let's say someone comes in the middle of the night with a broken something. They may or may not have their caretaker with them, their spouse, and um, and they're off, on, you know, they're in an off period. So yeah. confused, carry it away, carry it away with that situation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is not an uncommon <laughs> situation. You know, uh, a lot of times conditions that they refer to as delirium, can set into patients, even not may not even be on their first day on admission. It could be uh, usually you'd see this um, post surgically where they've got still some anesthetic in their in their system. They've probably been given um, one or more uh, analgesics, perhaps some opiates, some fentanyl or whatever during the procedure to help control pain, which is essential. We don't want to see anybody in pain. Um, and then all of a sudden they get brought back to their room and it's uh, it's that evening or maybe the next evening. And suddenly, you know, the patient begins to deteriorate in the sense that they're very confused. Um, they're agitated. They're belligerent. They're not listening to what you're saying. They're thrashing around in the bed. They're not taking orders from the nursing staff or, or their own care partner. Or perhaps they're beginning to hallucinate. Hallucinations is very common with delirium. Uh, so it's a scary situation. So, you know, typically what would happen is, you know, when this starts happening, the, the care partner will ring for the nurse to come in. The nurse comes in and she'll try her best to try to calm the patient and do whatever. But if that fails, then she'll end up putting a call out for the, uh, the hospitalist or, or the doctor that's on call uh, for that evening who really hasn't had, has probably never even met the patient before, quite frankly. Uh, and they'll come in and, and all too often what they'll do to quiet the patient who's experiencing delirium is they'll, they'll use a product called Haldol or Haloperidol, um, which, which works. I mean, it, 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 it fixes one problem, but it creates another one. Um, it's, it should probably not be used. It's not the drug of choice for a Parkinson's patient. Um, that we've substantiated many times. It's actually in the literature that it's not, it shouldn't be used, but the fact is it still is used. It's a very good drug for what you want it to do, but unfortunately, it's a dopamine blocker. So that's the one thing, the problem with Parkinson's is there's not enough dopamine. So if you're going to administer a drug that's going to block even more dopamine or block dopamine from getting to where it needs to go, that's only going to worsen the motor symptoms that are associated with Parkinson's. So yes, the patient now has calmed down. You've been able to secure them and, and they come back a little bit. But unfortunately, their Parkinson's symptoms have worsened. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's a problem that could take days, even a week or longer for them to fully recover. If you and I were to get a shot of Haldol for that same reason, let's say the next morning, we'd probably wake up and be a little groggy and tired from it. Uh, but we would be able to maneuver and get around. Not so much with a PD patient. They would be they would be in bed for a while. And the, the consequences of that is um, now let's say maybe they were scheduled for physical therapy right away the next day. They like to get you up and going out of bed after these surgical procedures. That's definitely not going to happen because they're essentially frozen in the bed right now until right. their body clears all of that medication out. So it, delay, it takes a two-day hospital stay and turns it into five or seven days. Um, and that's assuming even when they get home, it, it could take weeks or months for them to recover from that. 
So we don't advocate that. There are other drugs, which again is in that, that aware and care kit that the physician okay. can choose from. Um, but it doesn't always happen that way because these emergency situations happen and they never seem to happen nine to five. They no, always seem to no. happen in the middle of the night, you know, uh, when you can't reach out to anybody, you can't get your neurologist on the phone, these things happen. And they, and the response has to happen right now. Right. So, um, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, but again, education is key. And if the patient and the care partner and the hospital staff are educated uh, on the do's and don'ts medication wise, it can make the journey much better for the patient. And I guess it's probably pretty smart to us, you know, like nobody wants to be in that situation. Um, I've sat with some of our friends um, when, you know, post-surgery and they, you know, we're hallucinating, we're asking, you know, weird questions and, and um, just in a really, really rough place, you know, and um, no, nobody wants to be in that place. No. But I guess if you've got Parkinson's, you should assume that it's going to happen. So therefore, like, come prepared and then educate, like, beforehand, you know, like, nobody wants it. But I guess, you know, preparing for the worst, and um, hoping that it doesn't happen yeah. is, is the key, you know? Yeah. And that's one of the, the good things about that aware and care kit that I tell people all the time that you should pack everything and have that that's your go bag. So mm -hmm. even if you, they they fall and you call the ambulance, you just grab that bag and you take it with you. Yeah. It should be ready to go at all times. If not physically having the bottles in there with today, everyone does a little computer thing. They make a list, you know, a spreadsheet mm -hmm. or something, stick that in there. And if, yeah. you, if you're not that computer savvy, even easier. Go right to your pharmacy. We do this all the time, especially at tax time. People want to print out of everything they got for the year. Just ask the pharmacist, could you get a printout of, of everything that I'm on right now? And it, it, it's two keystrokes to probably, and they print How, it right out and hand it to you. And you can stick yeah. that right in the bag. Um, How cool is a, that? I didn't even know that yeah. was a service. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It, ha it yeah. happens every tax season. It happens. <laughs> um, no, it's no, a great no. way of putting everything together in one place. And you can grab and go with this, Put bring it with you in the back of the ambulance if you have to rhyme with them. And this way you're assured from the ER staff to the surgical staff to the, to the, to, to a physical therapy, everybody knows what they can and can't do for you. Yeah. Uh, and I have to tell you a great success story. I just had an 81 year old woman that I spoke to had a knee replacement, um, went over to the a local hospital here, um, been a PD patient for about six or seven years right now, had an absolutely flawless, uneventful process okay. from start to finish. Uh, all her meds were given to her on time. She did have the aware and care kit. Um, nice. It's like a little bracelet she wore and she, there's little magnets they put up on their, on their door, above their bed, on the, on the headboard. Uh, and she was handing out those leaflets to everybody. <laughs> I don't know which oh, I'm one. I'm proud of her. That's awesome. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was so thrilled and she sent me an email when she got, uh, got home thanking me for uh, telling her about the Aware and Care Kit and what a great experience she had. Uh, so like I say, we are making progress. It's slow and it's difficult from both ends. I, I don't envy yeah. the hospital. Um, you know, they try their best and the nurses really do. They want to help. No one wants to see anybody suffer or be, no, you know, no. or have a problem or worsen their condition. Uh, that's not their intention. We all want to make sure everything goes smoothly. So we're getting yeah. there. I, yeah, and I and I believe it, and I do have a lot of respect for our hospital staff and those who are working through the night. You know, it's uh, yeah. it's a tough place. I um a couple of years ago, I haven't spent much time in the hospital, but a couple of years ago, um, I had um, an emergency surgery uh, for a mm -hmm. um, a strangulated, um, I think that's the right word, hernia, um, yeah. Yeah. and um, and I, it was no big deal. I'm just you know, I think I could have made it to the next day to drove myself, but um, they wouldn't even let me leave the. Uh, when I went to go get checked out and they got the um, MRI or the CAT scan of my stomach, they sent me by ambulance, right? So mm -hmm. I, I made a joke with the people in the ambulance, like, am I like the most healthy person you've ever had to transport now? Like, I mean, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I mean, I got a little sore spot in my tummy, but like, I'm like, this is weird, you know, but the experience was enlightening because um, yeah, they had the emergency surgery scheduled for me as soon as they could get in, but other people were higher priority, you know? Um, and um, so my surgery was scheduled for like, I don't know, five in the morning. Um, so I spent an, an evening in, um, in the actual ER and this was in um, a trauma unit. And, um, and so I'm seeing everything and, and the staff were doing their best, you know, and there were people with 
broken things, bloodied. Yeah. And they, you know, and that could have been somebody with Parkinson's, you know, but, and they're just trying their best to make sure everybody is like, you know, not ignored right. for the moment right. until they can get into the surgery. And the surgeon was very kind. And, um, but I can see how easy it would be for them. They can just see your injury. They're not going to see your Parkinson's. So, yeah. you know, and if they see your injury and then you're Go, then you're having, you know, an off time episode of some sort, you know, I can see that panic sit in for yeah. like that potential for everybody. So especially if, if you're a Parkinson's patient and you're on levodopa every two, two and a half hours, that's tough for the nursing staff. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a huge problem for them, you know, to drop everything they're doing every two hours and remember to go in and go see Mrs. Yeah. Jones every two hours. That's very hard to do. Uh, and yeah. so I get it from their perspective. I definitely get it. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's a meeting of the minds. We've already had it. And, and we're, we're coming up with solutions from both ends. And, and, and we're here and we're working with everyone. So we are getting there. And I just I kudos to them for even reaching yeah. out. They want to see improvement. So yeah, we're getting I love that. Absolutely. And thank you for your part, because I think we've probably progressed so much with just having an advocate like you. So our time is nearly done. We see that. So, and Bob, thank you again so much for um